Okay, we're rolling. All right, you ready? Yeah. Go. <laughs> this is one way to light this house, but it's totally dumb. Yeah, it's not the elegant way to light a home. And, and here we are, designers who work with the physics of a home, and yet I can't believe we even for a moment thought that maybe we could do this on our own, we could do the lighting on our own, uh-uh. No, so we've partnered with Kitchler, and they have come on board full steam, and we so appreciate it. Yeah, they're really interested in having this conversation about the science behind how to light things, and layers we're gonna get into, all the 101 of how to think about lighting, because of course a lot of people are just, and a lot of builders, are just gonna add lights at the end. Mm -hmm. um, without necessarily, I thought too, the paint colors, the tile types, the shininess of finishes, um, how many windows and where they are, where people are gonna stand, what kind of directionality you want, what the spread of the beams are, all that stuff. So because we're always trying to tune all of the dynamics of the house, this is a great way to demonstrate everything that we talk about on this channel uh, and on the television show Home Diagnosis. This is gonna be a pretty long uh, video conference call, and so forgive the quality, but I'm sure that we're all used to video calls right now since we're all in oh, quarantine. Yeah. Uh, hopefully this is not unusual for you to look at, but uh, we didn't do a very heavy edit on what Jeff had to say because so much of what he had to say was really awesome. Really for any build project that you're working on. Jeff Dross is the Director of Education at Kitchler, and he has been with the company for like 45 years. He's been the head of basically every department at the company. He understands this very, very basic level as well as the very high level. So we're gonna bring them down to our level for a minute and then we're gonna go through <laughs> the basic level. All of the all the kind of nitty-gritty <laughs> stuff about this house so that you can see how it might work on other houses. So get ready to dig into the foot candles, the lumens, the color temperatures, and all the crazy things and the objectives we're trying to do with this home with our designer Jeff. So Jeff Dross, thank you very much for joining us today. We are here to talk about your immense knowledge at Kitchler Lighting, the first thing that strikes me is that when we're talking about the home as a system and controlling the physics and the chemistry of in the indoors, which is what everything we do on this YouTube channel and on the Home Diagnosis Television Show is about, lighting seems like such an obvious teaching tool where it, it is a part of a system. When you turn on the light, it is shining on things that are also in the space and they can, like you just said, it needs to kind of be harmonious and tuned to the things you're putting in. If you have chrome everywhere on the inside of your house, and you have nothing but direct lighting, you're gonna get all these really fierce, you know, shiny things. More likely, what I have in houses that I visit is nothing but recessed lighting. Just, just like a field of 50 recessed holes in the ceiling. And it just seems like people don't understand, including me. Okay. This is why we initially started talking, right? Is because I approached Kitchell, I said, hey, can you guys please help us to figure out how to even start designing the lighting plan. Um, because I don't understand how to pick between hanging lights, recessed lights, sconces, up lights, down lights, lamps. Um, can you kind of give us a 101 on how to even start thinking about lighting when you've got a space that you're trying to, to live in? Um, absolutely. I think the first thing that you want to do is understand how you're going to uh, define the perimeter, essentially define the space. One of the reasons why you do have a tendency to see a lot of recessed lighting is because it's, it's, it is a relatively easy way to define essentially the four corners of a space. So by placing a recessed can in each of the corners, um, you just sort of understand the confines of that particular room. Um, it's easy, uh, recessed cans are relatively inexpensive. Um, it's a pretty easy task for the electrician to do. They, they do it quite often, so they become quite proficient at it. Um, so the reason why you're seeing that is because it's an easy those perimeters. That's the only way, but it's kind of an easy, um, less expensive way. The other reason why I think you see a lot of recessed cans is because aesthetically, it's pretty benign. Um, you, you really um, are not going to have a traditional recessed can or a contemporary recessed can or an arts and crafts uh, recessed can. It's just a basic utilitarian uh, piece of light. So that way, if you're moving into a new home and you don't know if uh, you have uh, aesthetic preferences or something traditional or, you know, French provincial <laughs> you want, um, you, you, uh, those recessed pieces don't really define a style. Um, 
when you start selecting something other than the recessed cans to define the space, that's when you start adding a bit of aesthetic element into the mix. So you're combining the functionality that lighting provides with the aesthetic. So again, the recessed cans uh, don't restrict you in that way. So if you do in fact have a traditional aesthetic uh, sensibilities, part of that word is tradition. You have to look back into what happened before. Um, chandeliers were based on just needing to have more candles in the middle of a room when you owned a castle. So they put a bunch of arms from a center just to hold uh, more candles into a central space. Um, at some point, they took that candle and then they bored a hole in the middle of it and ran gas through it. And then they took that gas out and they ran electrical wires through it. If you enjoy contemporary design, you don't need to replicate a light bulb. So a designer is now starting with a blank sheet of paper and she can create something completely unique, completely different, something that you would never ever have been imagined when you tried to stuff an incandescent light bulb into that design. So first off, as I said, the recess cans kind of define that space. And then you have to start understanding how, uh, it, what type of task might be, um, might be uh, taking part in that particular room. So if it's a living room, are you likely to be a person who really is interested in reading? You've got lighting that's gonna be appropriate for that particular task. Um, and then the third layer that you wanna, you wanna think about is accent. How am I gonna simply make this room beautiful? Now, the thing that's interesting about lighting is um, those, those three areas, the ambient layer, the uh, accent layer, and the task layer, they can be provided by one lighting product. So if you have a very small bathroom uh, and you really don't have any ability to put anything more than a single uh, light source in that space, it can serve as a task, it can serve uh, as an ambient uh, way of light, and it can also be beautiful. So, um, so those are the three areas that you really want to you, you want to approach a room. How am I going to define the ambiance? What task is taking uh, place in that space? And can I do something with light that's going to make or elevate that room? Okay, great. So in the plans that you so thoughtfully and thoroughly built for our big house that we're building right outside the window there, and you gave us tons of notes too to understand how you were kind of the options you were building and things like that. How did you decide between something like the um, down light okay. and the sconces and then the hanging lights? Are there kind of rules for where you put chandeliers um, I mean, it seems like over a giant dining table, of course, that seems like it would make sense. But, um, you know, how, how, what about like casting shadows and things like that? How, how does that work as you kind of enter a space? I would be worried that I would be casting a shadow on things that um, that I haven't thought about before I actually right. moved into the space. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple things that that start coming into in, into play as you look at it. Basically, you have a blank piece of paper. And frankly, you can do as a lighting designer, you can do almost anything you want. There's, there's a lot of options. There are some reasons why I might select recessed cans as opposed to um, uh, sconces, for example. Uh, and uh, in, in, the, in your particular plan, uh, I gave you two options. I, uh, I thought because of this very large room and um, you, it might be an interesting idea to use a series of sconces that kind of wrap around the perimeter of the space, especially if there's a two-story uh, great room, for example. Now, this one, I believe, was just one story. Is that correct? It, yeah, the ceiling height goes from just like this room does, 10 feet at the lower end and then 16 feet at the high end in that room. Okay. All right, that's, and that was the part that I, that I couldn't make out. So because of that, one of the reasons why I would like to use those sconces is because um, while you're in, if the room was simply a nine foot or a 10 foot ceiling, uh, it's kind of a human scale or it's a human size, if you will. But as you start moving up to that 16 foot um, ceiling height, it starts beginning a little daunting. So what the sconces do by being maintained at a, at a consistent 
level, um, they kind of humanize that space. They kind of make you feel comfortable. It kind of gives you a sense that you're going to be tucked into that great room. And even though there's a 10 foot of, of ceiling height above your head, you're still at a very human uh, at, at a very human size or at a very human scale. The other thing that is in that room is a suggestion to put some uh, grounded floor outlets next to the uh, sofa area. Um, just simply because if you're going to put some tables, you're going to put some table lamps, you certainly don't want to run an extension cord across uh, what looks like about an eight foot distance from the wall to the sofa. You're likely to be moving in any number of different ways. If it were a more confined space, or if there were defined doors leading into a room like you might've found in older homes, having those extension cords running in specific directions is not gonna be a problem because you kind of understand how people are gonna move around the area. They're going to move around the space in this particular direction because that's where the door is or that's where the, uh, the next space that they're moving into. But with an open floor plan like you're seeing here, using those floor COs is a really nice way to keep those extension cords out from under and preventing any of those fall risks. That makes a lot of sense. And it sounds very simple when you describe it that way. I love it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, like, when I learned about indirect lighting, I thought, oh, I want everything to be indirect. I just love it. It's not, it's never going to glare in my eyes. I think my worst experience of lighting is when I, you know, we bought our first condo in Chicago and I laid down on the bed and the light of the fan was on and all of the ball, four bulbs were on, blazing and I just... I was like, ah, and it was casting, you know, the shadow up from the fan. So I just feel like the direct light, I understand, of course, that it's a very amateur reaction to say, oh, I want everything to be indirect. So can you talk a little bit about two things? One is the, the difference between the indirect that you could use kind of the Kitchler LED tape that you guys have for mm -hmm. versus direct. And then also, can you talk a little bit about the math of how you start to kind of approach the metrics sure. of the spaces that we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, let's let's uh, let's do the math uh, to begin with, just because it will help kind of set the set the pace for. What I use is a pretty simple method. Uh, the Illuminating Engineering Society (IES) uh, they provide a recommended uh, foot candle measured light for almost every room. Frankly, every room in, in, on the planet. So, if you're designing a ballroom, they'll give you a, a, the amount of light that's needed. If you're designing a living room, they will give you the amount of light that's needed. Take the square footage, multiply it by that foot candle, and it will tell you how many lumens are needed. So that's an easy to, easy to find um, chart on the internet. So let's say they recommend you to have 2,000 lumens of light. You can take the sconces that you've wrapped around your particular living room and, um, and total them up. The lighting manufacturers will tell you what that lumen number is for each lighting fixture. If you're using retrofit light bulbs, there is a lumen number on each one of those. You can simply total them up and make sure that you at least get to that number. Now, you can always do a little bit more. If you do a little bit more, you might want to consider adding a dimmer on one or two of those switches. So from a pure, pure math standpoint, that just gets you a number. So in that particular living room, I need 1,000 or 2,000 lumens of light. And then just simply add, lighting is cumulative. So a 100 lumen lighting product here and a 100 lumen lighting product here will give you 200. There's no factor uh, within that. As far as direct and indirect, your initial reaction that indirect is great light is absolutely correct. Uh, our eyes are sensitive to glare, and, and as we age, we become more and more sensitive to glare. So um, maybe it's going to be fine for you when you're 25 or 35, but if you get to be an old guy like me, all of a sudden you start noticing that that light is, gets very glary. So an indirect light essentially eliminates that glare and just lights the room with a very, very comfortable light it is probably the nicest, easiest light source to live with. You could, in fact, light that entire room with indirect light. 
but you're probably going to need more light because indirect, indirect light obviously bounces. And when it bounces or reflects, there is a reduction of light that ultimately pops out. So think about this. There's, there are different percentages of reflective surfaces. If we have an all-white room, generally, the, um, that white uh, surface will reflect about 90% of that light. So light comes in, bounces off, and 90% uh, is delivered. Now, conversely, if you were to paint that room black, the light, 100% of the light would hit the surface, but only about 10 or 15% of that light bounces out. So if you decided to use an indirect light source in a black room, you would need substantially larger amounts of light in order to get usable light source in that space. You can also have sort of semi-direct light. Uh, so for example, if you take a chandelier and you've got an exposed light bulb, uh, like a classic Williamsburg chandelier, if you, if you will, you'll have an exposed light bulb and that would be the most direct light source. But if you have a slightly different lighting fixture that might have a white diffuser over the top, you're gonna essentially break down some of that, uh, some of that light. So it's going to be direct, but it's not gonna be as glaring on your eyes. So there are levels of direct and indirect that, that you're gonna feel more comfortable with. A well-lit room is gonna have a little bit of both. Um, I, don't, I think if you have only exposed direct light, you're gonna be, it's going to, you're gonna have an adverse reaction. Um, but having a nice blend of both, is, I think in fact, uh, creates a much more inviting environment. So if we're gonna use the layering approach of the three layers, and let me just try and remember these, ambient uh, layer, right. the uh, uh, task layer, I remember is the last one. What's the third one? Accent. Accent, okay, great. Yes. So if we're gonna be using these, um, do, do I need to match the color rendering index or the CRI of all of the, should they be the same? Because I know that when we had incandescent, they were all the same because it was literally just, it was a physical process of creating the light, right? We're actually like heating up an element. So now that we've got CFLs and LEDs, and maybe we don't have CFLs anymore. <laughs> I haven't checked, but um, <laughs> how, how do we approach the, the color oh, aspect of this? Yeah, it's a very common question. Um, and designers ask this question a lot. So I always, I always kind of turn this back onto, uh, onto the designer. Uh, when I, and I tell them, are, do you have to have absolutely every white surface in a kitchen match exactly the same? So do your, do your white appliances need to match cabinets? Do the white cabinets need to match the white subway tiles? Do the subway tiles need to match the countertop? And the answer is probably not. However, if you're going to mix colors, you better do them in a very purposeful way. You, you can't just say, well, I'm not going to think about it at all. You have to understand if you're going to use different colors, why am I using a different color light? Why am I going to accept a different color light? Um, color rendering, uh, the CRI, the color rendering index, probably is going to be less important for above cabinet lighting than it is for the under cabinet lighting. So your under cabinet lighting is going to be lighting food that you're going to be preparing as you're working on a countertop or on a surface. So do you want the carrots to look anemic? Probably don't. However, what actual light are you getting from those above cabinet lights? If those were a little bit a lower CRI, would you care? Because all it's lighting is the ceiling. It's just giving you, it's giving you an aura. It's essentially helping you believe that that kitchen space is larger than it might really be. But you get this impression because you see all that space up there that it's a much bigger kitchen. Uh, as far as the color temperature of the light source, if I'm going to have a slightly different color temperature, why am I doing that? For what reason have I selected a slightly different color temperature? Do I want to call out something in a different part of the room and make it look a little bit more vibrant? Do I have a crystal collection in a cabinet in the on the side of the on the side of the kitchen? 
If I have a crystal collection, if I put a blue or light in that crystal cabinet, all of that crystal is just going to pop. And is your LED technology at Kitchler capable of like doing multiple colors? I know that there are a lot of the real flashy, you know, you see a car driving down the street and it's booming uh, crazy music. Yeah. It's probably going to have some underlights that are changing from blue to green to red, et cetera. Can, can all LEDs do that or is that a special feature of something? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a special feature. So you, have, you would have to engineer that in. Now we do right now have uh, some under cabinet light that will provide either 2,700 or 3,000 Kelvin uh, color temperature. Um, essentially what you're doing is flipping a switch. And if you happen to have a blue kitchen and um, you know you put the new cabinet lighting in and then you decide to paint the, or paint the kitchen yellow, you can actually switch that over to 2,700. So you should select the color temperature that's gonna work best for the, for the room that you're in and, um, and, the, the, and the surroundings, the materials. A lot of wood, a lot of yellows, a lot of golds, uh, oranges, 2700 Kelvin is going to work better. If you have blues, purples, um, lots of black and white, slate, gray neutrals, use a 3000 Kelvin color temperature. Uh, those are two, really the only two that you're going to want to use in, um, in a residence. Excellent. So I, I have one plug that I'd really like to make, which is that thank you for coming out with a uh, something that looks like a recessed can light, okay. which in home performance land, we do not like because they poke right. holes in the actual enclosure of the house in the sure, most sure. ceiling. Yeah. Uh, so you have a puck. It's like a, it's not recessed. It's actually surface. Yeah, the LED light. down light. Right. Right. So, and, but, and so one of the follow-up questions on that, which I will definitely be incorporating some of those in this house. Okay. But, I have become aware in talking to some lighting professionals that the way that the industry has gone with efficiency is that we took away all the incandescent lights, right? And I don't know if, what the status is on that, if you could let us know if there's any update on that governmental ban on the um, yeah, incandescent right. bulbs. But uh, it sounded like early on when it was like, oh, well, incandescents create 90% heat and 10% light and LEDs create 90% light and 10% heat. It's better, right? Except that it seems like a lot of manufacturers have um, had to make the entire device, the entire fixture, one thing, so that if anything fails, and the LED being 50,000 hours might not matter if you buy a low quality fixture, it's the heat sink or the wiring or some other component that's going to go bad before the diode goes bad, right? So then at that point, there's no, you can't just replace out a part. You have to take that entire thing off the wall and replace it with an entire other thing. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I can. Standpoint? You know, so we unfortunately or fortunately have been born with the idea that we are all lighting fixture service and repair people. Every person you know, every person that you can walk by on the street has got a closet in their house someplace where they keep spare light bulbs. And it's your job to repair them and keep them serviceable. Um, that is something that is likely to start disappearing. Uh, as, as lighting fixtures become more a part of the, uh, of the structure of the house, they're gonna turn more into an appliance. So when you think about a refrigerator, you buy a refrigerator, 18 years later, something doesn't work, what do you do? You pull the refrigerator out and you go to the store, you buy a new refrigerator, put it in, and you forget about the refrigerator. Uh, we used to buy a flat screen. We used to buy a television and there were tubes in the back side of the television. When they switched over to solid state televisions or, um, or flat screens, all of that, all of those tubes disappeared. So all of a sudden we don't have television repair people any longer. We simply use the television. It dies after five, 10 years. We throw it in the garbage and we buy another one because the technology is so much higher up. So we're going to be moving from, I, I would say that it's, it's kind of moving from a furniture store type of environment to more of an appliance environment. So when we buy furniture, we ask different questions. Well, this is pretty, oh, this matches my, this, this will look good with the drapes. I like this sofa. But then we move to an appliance store and the appliance store, you say, well, what's the warranty? How much water am I gonna use in this washing machine? Uh, how long does the cycle take to, to do a load of laundry? 
So you ask different questions. You ask much more mechanical questions on those items. That's what is going to be happening. We're, we're slowly transitioning from this furniture store mentality or this aesthetically driven um, um, idea of deciding upon lighting to a much more technical side. Uh, we're gonna be asking harder questions. And one of those questions, well, what kind of warranty am I going to get? How long is this? Is the driver gonna stay? Is the, is the entire package gonna work? The likelihood is that we are going to continue to see transitions from older technology to LED, but it's not necessarily it's not necessarily going to be every single type of product. So if you if you look at the whole landscape of lighting, the, everything in in the world, um, street lights are one by one, city by city, switching over to an LED technology. Traffic lights, uh, I don't believe they're even making any incandescent traffic lights any longer. They are all LED. Now, there's plenty of incandescent pieces left here, but the new ones are all. So you've got this transition that's moving away inside for, for you know, just residents and typical uh, homeowners. Landscape lighting is an industry that is almost completely switched over to an LED uh, lighting. Uh, most under cabinet lighting is now LED. Recess cans that we were talking about earlier, that is an LED business at this point. Um, bathrooms are slowly shifting over to, uh, to an LED technology. So what you're seeing is kind of like the little Pac-Man guy. He's kind of gobbling up each of these little industries. So what's going to be left? Uh, you know, the thing that is going to be the least likely to change now are going to be those traditional chandeliers. 20 years from now, um, if you have grandchildren, they are probably not even gonna know how to ch change a light bulb. You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you didn't even know how to start when you were looking at a floor plan. How am I gonna make this, um, make this room look great? I've designed a beautiful house. How am I gonna make it look wonderful? Well, there are lighting professionals and retailers all across the United States that do that day in and day out. So if you were to walk into any lighting retailer that's in your neighborhood, and you know there's, there's thousands of them across America, and say, hey, I got a new floor plan, they're not going to say, oh, gee, I don't know what to do. They're going to grab the floor plan and start sketching and saying, okay, great, you need this, you need this, you need this, let's do this here. They're going to jump right in, essentially just like I jumped into the floor plans that you sent me. Um, so rely on those folks to help you purchase those pieces um, that they know to be a good quality. I'm gonna give you the perfect lighting plan. And what I think most um, designers should do is provide the perfect lighting plan. If the customer says, well, geez, I, I, I can't do that. The idea is not to simply take out 50% of the lights. You need to start looking at, at the lighting as a part of the whole. You can't simply say, okay, well, I'm in, I spent all my money on the appliances and you know, I bought this great Italian uh, range and, and now I'm gonna have to cheapen up on the lighting. So let's just put junk in the kitchen for the lighting. All of that money that you just spent is never gonna be realized. Nobody's gonna be able to see it because you're gonna have a poor lighting plan or it's gonna be bad color or you're just not gonna have enough of it. So you will have spent all that money for not. So if you look at a plan and you say, okay, well, that's way too much money. I, I can't spend that amount of money. Um, let's look at bringing everything down. No one ever says, you know what? The kitchen is too expensive. Let's leave out the refrigerator. If your cost is way too high, we need to, we need to ramp down everything, not just cherry pick the lighting um, or the flooring. The home is a system. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much for everything you shared with us today, Jeff. Um, we're going to have you back, hopefully, when we install all this stuff into the house. Um, we're going to see if we can get you to come down here and uh, join us for that. I and um, that. I hope that you stay healthy and calm while the world is on pause uh, for a moment. But thank you very much for your time today. We'll it's talk. My pleasure. Soon. My pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Take care. 
We hope you've enjoyed all of this information and stay tuned while we start to implement the lighting and bring it into our house. Yeah, make sure that you don't light your house this way when you're doing your own uh, and make sure to pay attention also to the other physics, chemistry, microbiology that we're paying attention to. Please do comment, like, subscribe. Tune in next time.